transmission and control loops and so on today. And um, I want to step back a bit from that and um, continue with a kind of a different topic. And um, I called it uh, installation and integration of the PSL. And uh, I, I, actually, I basically brought a bunch of uh, photographs. So it might be relaxing. I mean, it, it had been a long day, so it might be quite <laughs> enjoyable for you. Uh, it could also be boring. I know it can be boring to look at other people's pictures. So um, if it's so, please raise your hand, and then I can easily just replace a part of this presentation by something else. So. OK. So um, oh. oh, I forgot to plug this in. OK, <clears throat> here's a short outline. Uh, I want to talk a bit on the construction and the history of the PSL, PSL actually. And again, I, I just put together a couple of pictures. I want to show you how that thing grows and how we um, finally achieve the final state of that thing. And I'm going to um, show you a bit of the, on the, of the pre preparation of the sites. And um, what I mean by that is, the preparations for this laser system. So of course, they had, an inf uh, had a Michelson before uh, advanced LIGO started, and they even had a laser. So, but, but there were some modifications which were necessary um, to put that uh, PSL into, into the instrument. And there was a topic saying like sending lasers around the world, which is more or less like how did we uh, well, we built that thing in Germany, and then we sent it over to the US. So there were some some things, and then I talk a bit on the integration um, in Hanford and Livingston. Um, so here's the timeline. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, um, actually, the the development of lasers for gravitational wave detectors started way before that. But that's kind of the the, the year where I feel that the laser centrum in Hanover sort of stepped in. So they had a two-head laser systems, like in bow tie configurations. Not for, not for LIGO, but there's also a gravitational wave detector right next to Hanover. So it had been used there. And then there was a long time where we were um, uh, investigating how to build a 200-watt laser uh, with a thing called laboratory prototype. There was a a time around 2008 where we were asked to build a functional prototype. So that's a typo again. I'm sorry for that. Um, which were actually made to demonstrate that that one can build this 200 watt laser with certain uh, certain features. We came up with this engineering prototype. I already talked about a bit about it, and that was that's basically to show how to put the parts together and so on. And um, yeah, then in the last couple of years the observatory lasers had been uh, built, actually. And here are the, here's the first set of pictures. So that's from the very early years. Um, and the bow tie uh, configuration, um, uh, it, it, it looks like that. So it, it's also um, neodymium yak crystals uh, sitting, sitting here, or here in these copper-cooled heat sinks. They are already longitudinally pumped. And then it's, again, a ring laser with two output beams. And um, here's actually an overall setup. And it was really like that That was an injection lock system. So this idea is not really new. It, 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 it already worked like that. So there's, again, an N-Pro. And then the beam is fed it through an EOM and, an, and a Faraday isolator into this bow tie configuration here. So that's a 14 watt um, laser. And it had been used in, in GEO as a light source. Um, but, uh, but of course, there was starting a certain, was that a question? Or? No, there was starting already a competition on how does the advanced LIGO look like. So of course, it was way ahead of time. But um, people in different parts of the world started to uh, think about, OK, we need, it's clear that um, sooner or later we need more laser power. So how are we going to build that? And um, uh, in this case, well, we started to build this um, two-head system. So um, I used it in previous uh, talks as a simplification. But in fact, that's how that thing started. And um, yeah, actually, it, it, 
Mm. Eventually, there was also an injection lock system of that, so you can just easily close that ring, put a piezo mirror here for the length control of that um, system, and then you send in a master beam, do the pound through a hall locking, and you get a, get a decent power output beam. Of course, it was not a 200 watt laser system, but that was uh, the first stage, um, or actually the preparing stage for the laboratory prototype as it appeared first <clears throat> and um, um, it, it, it looks quite close to what we what we have now so again it's four neodymium crystals water cooled you have this biofringence compensation I was talking about there are the crystals are longitudinally pumped and the light source was not an uh, was not this 35 watt uh, front end in this case it was exactly this 14 watt uh, laser that I've shown on the on the first slide in 2003. So that thing was still around. So in other words, you have two injection lock system. This one, which is injection locked to the end pro, and then this big thing, which is, um, which is injection locked to um, this 14, 14 watt laser. And as you can see, this is a symmetric setup. So that's not the kind of mode selection I, I, I kept talking about. It's um, symmetrical and the output is somewhere between the crystals. Here's a photograph of that um, of that system. So the beam is somehow coming from here, and then there is some place where a piezo mirror is mounted. I think it's this one. This looks like a piezo mirror here. And then you have this zigzag pass, and then the, the outcoupling of the beam is somewhere here. So you can see the the light is going here somewhere between the pump lenses. So that's how an early version of the pump heads looked like. At that stage, the uh, laser development wasn't actually that far. So the, the pump lights weren't that good. And that's why we had um, um, not, not this um, uh, uh, fiber bundle configuration with the seven fibers. It was 10, in fact, because the pump lights just didn't have enough power. So you can imagine that there were some other difficulties, like you can't put this can't have this densest packing of spheres or cylinders or whatever, so it was slightly asymmetric. And then we tried to compensate for that with a, with a bigger homogenizer and try to make the light bouncing around such that it's kind of round and um, so on. So it's a lot of components which are basically really look like a lab uh, setup. There's a question. We have had good drawings regarding dust settling on optics and burning yeah. the optics. Yes, we had. So it, it, it's, it's not not really a clean room environment or something. It's just a normal lab. It's basically a room. Maybe there was a flow bench somewhere, but it's not really uh, clean. And I'm going to comment on that. I, actually, I, I brought a couple of pictures for that. So, so you had also a growing concern over the years. It, I can tell you it was, it was so bad that we, that there was a certain time when we were working on this laboratory prototype, and we basically had to swap the crystals like every three weeks or so. So it was ridiculously expensive. And finally, we figured out that it's probably cheaper to build a clean room than uh, exchanging the crystals like every two weeks or so. <laughs> yeah. In the, right. The final laser. Yes. Uh, what kind of uh, master injection power is required for a stable operation of the final laser? Well, um, I showed you this formula for the locking bandwidth. There's a term uh, which, which actually depends on the, on the master power and the slave laser power. And the higher the slave laser power is, the, the bigger is the, is the logging bandwidth. So the easier it is to, to match the frequencies. But on the other hand, you of course also want to have a, a high master power because you want to build a high power laser somehow. So yeah, it's kind of a trade-off. But uh, when, we, when we changed, um, when we when we change from the 14 watt this 14 watt bow tie ring laser to uh, to another seat uh, seat source and that's exactly this uh, 35 watt amplifier that for sure helped because you double the, the power of the um, um, uh, of, um, of your uh, seat laser and that helps with regard of the locking bandwidth so that's much easier. And uh, of course, also it's also easier to not have like two injection locked systems and then try to couple them. It, it's easier to just have this amplifier and then send the light through, and you can be sure that um, the beam looks nice. Okay, and that uh, uh, this is the year. So in about 2006, we came up 
also with the idea of this asymmetric resonator design, it looks a bit different than what we have now. So it is an asymmetric resonator with this short arm which can be changed. So it was sitting on a, not on a motorized stage, but we already realized that we need some fine tuning for this length. So there's a micrometer table here. <clears throat> and, um, and we didn't have the, had this um, outcoupling of the laser light in between the pump heads. So it, it's kind of nicer to have it that way. So you don't have any overlapping beams here. And it's kind of inconvenient to have the output coupler somewhere between the pump heads where you have something like 500 watts of pump power. And then you're hanging on the table. And you know your t-shirt gets burned all the time and so on. So it's, um, and it's a nicer design. And um, with this system, we have seen an injection lock output power of 183 watts already. So it was not that that nice beam profile, but it was kind of roundish. And it was not, um, uh, at, at this time at least, not a long-term exper experience, but we've seen that. So then uh, we built this functional prototype. <coughs> and um, we, we improved the, uh, the, the surroundings, so to say, a bit. So you can see that we have these curtains as a floor box on top. We, um, try to modify the lab where we are working such that we try to keep it clean. We start wearing this clean room, frogs, wet mopping every week and so on. And we really try to keep some discipline to have it as clean as possible because we, exact, we had exactly that problem that we had uh, dirty components all the time. So this system is already uh, kind of modular. So you can see different plates here. So that's the amplifier, um, which had already been, I mean, the development on that had, had gone pretty far already. So it's not this complete box. But this amplifier box here is, is kind of ready. It's an early version of the diagnostic breadboard. And then we had this, uh, this plate here with the, with the um, laser heads on it. And the, the Faraday was still kind of separate. So that was not kind of box. Or actually, the whole thing wasn't box, but it was sitting on some um, plates. And we also came up with a, with a uh, I think a quite decent user interface. So that's a screenshot of that. Um, oh, this is actually a screenshot of the computer program we used. And um, yeah, I mean, here's the status field I was talking about earlier with this message, which just showed something like uh, laser turned off, which is, doesn't contain much information. Um, but at least there was some computer control, and we didn't have to turn the knobs on the power supply anymore to get a pump power we wanted. OK, and then uh, we really get around this, prob this, this problem with the, with the dust and, and dirt in the, in the laboratory. So um, uh, there was a clean room built at the laser centrum. <coughs> and, uh, and the uh, engineering prototype was actually the first system which had really been built in a clean room only. It's a completely boxed system. So the, the box is kind of missing in this picture, but um, it, it looks pretty much like the original system. So here you, 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 you see we didn't have these red hoses everywhere, these pressure, pressure resistant hoses at all. But um, um, the, the, the engineering work was done by a big part already. So I mean, we, we did some changes, and I talked about that earlier. So we had this water, water cooled base plate, for example. And, yeah, we, we were basically playing around with that. Um, oh, and this, this engineering prototype, by the way, is still around. So it's still sitting at, um, uh, at, the, at, at the AEI. It's not operating yet. But in principle, it's sort of modified such that it's very similar to the observatory lasers. And in principle, one can just start it if somebody needs a 160 or 180 watt laser or so, one can just um, use that system. The reference system, that's a system that had been built as a reference. So it's, it's working in, in principle as the observatory lasers all the time. It's sitting in Hanover. And it's meant to be uh, like if, if, if some sort of problem occurs somewhere, either with the laser or with the stabilization or so, some funny effects that somebody thinks uh, he sees, that then um, this reference system would be the system where people would go and try things out, try to find solutions, look at the long-term trends, because there is a full long-term monitoring of all the data, and, and, and try to see if that 
that effect is present in the other lasers as well. So that's the thing with this system. And it, it's also there to, to see if changes are doable or necessary or so on. Well, and then uh, from 2011 on, on, we started to build the uh, observatory lasers. And since the task was to build three lasers at once, two for Hanford, I mean, they, they had originally two interferometers in, in Hanford, one with a four kilometer arm length, one with a two kilometer arm length, and one for Livingston. So it's three lasers we had to deliver in a quite short time. We decided, oh, we have this nice big clean room, so let's build all three lasers at once. So I mean, we know from the engineering prototype what to do, and it's and and we already built the reference system, and we don't want to have the observatory lasers other than that system. So it's it's pretty much just ordering all the components and putting that together and starting with the alignment. So and that that was actually the time where we had quite a lot of uh, components in in our clean room. So there were two optical tables, one to align and build the system, and the other one for pre-assembling and, and storage of the components actually. So there was a, a huge bunch of mechanical things. These, for example, are the holders for the, for the uh, pump fibers with this water-cooled uh, uh, mount here. So the fiber tips actually hold it in an aluminum case and it's just screwed in into these things. These are parts of the pump heads. And as you can see, all the parts are gold-coated. And um, I'll tell you in a couple of slides why we did that. So it, it's, um, it's copper heat things, but um, they're all coated with a thin gold layer. We had a lot of optics to prepare. So some of them are just screwed into mounts. So these are commercial mirror mounts for the pump lenses. Uh, some of them are, were custom made. So these, for example, are the pickoffs in the pump light diagnostics, these AR windows. And those were made in a way that that we had to uh, uh, glue them in with some sort of special space glue. We decided to use this stuff because um, uh, that's something which is not supposed to outgas. So we, we uh, I mean, we made so many bad experiences with outgassing materials that we really wanted to go for some really expensive, fancy uh, uh, glue. So yes. So all the all, well, the, the 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 pump lenses are not. That's just standard pump lenses from the catalog, actually, because it's not really critical at that point. Um, uh, these are, yeah. Yes. The standard. The you mean these things? Yeah. Um, actually, they they are not really glued in. It's it's basically like three little dots which hold that thing in, in, in place. It, it's more or less gravity which holds them down, but you want to fix it somehow because, uh, I mean, we, we, we pre-align everything and then we put it in a big box and send it over to America. So that's, um, you, you know, you, you never know what happens to that, to that box, right? Maybe just somebody put it upside down or so. <laughs> oh, these, these mounts are custom made. Because they need to fit into this pump light diagnostic, so the, it, it's a space problem. Yeah, you you have calculated um, pump optics, and you somehow have to match something in between. To and and it has to be something where you don't cut away too much of your pump light because you want to have a precise number for the for for the photodiode readout. So the photodiode actually goes into this little gap here on a little plastic um, mount, and then um, that's it. Mm -hmm. No, some are. So let's see this electronics part, and then we have some water supplies also assembled in this. So it was really packed. And, um, and, and then we had some modules. For example, these are the piezo mirrors. And they were, of course, investigated. So we did transfer functions for all of these um, uh, piezo mirrors, which are, in the end, responsible for the injection locking. And yeah, first of all, we wanted to see if they're all the same. And uh, second, of course, we wanted to make sure that the, that the control loop for these mirrors works probably and damps the resonance frequency of, of um, these, these mirrors a bit. So actually, the, uh, the, they are made, I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, that's actually the, the, 
the mirror which is responsible for the injection locking and it's it's two piezos. There's one on one side and another one on the other side and they are kind of doing this to uh, not have this mirror mount shaking. So, right. yes, right. And yeah, so on one side there is this uh, HR mirror for the, for the beam that's reflected from that and on the other side there's an, an AR coated substrate, same size, same weight. Well, and then these are the, the, um, the mounts for the Faraday. So, so the Faraday rotator goes into in, in this gap. And these are a, a bunch of these uh, um, uh, pump heads again. And of course, we had also not, not only uh, these modules, that's not only the parts for the, for the three lasers, it's, it's also spare parts. So we had a really strong spare policy, which is probably good in terms of LIGO India. And um, uh, th that's actually why there are five Faraday isolators and not only three, one for each laser. So the other ones are the spares. They are also pre-assembled, pre-aligned. So if, if something goes terribly wrong, one can just swap the whole module. And of course, there's some, some alignment required, but um, it's, it's sort of easy to do. So that's part of what I would understand as easy maintenance. Okay, yeah, and then of course there was a phase of assembly and um, alignment. So that's that's me and, and Lutz Winkelmann, and we just tried to get the required power out of that thing. So it, it didn't take forever. So as you've seen for the laboratory prototype, we were basically working on that for something like four or five years. And then for all the other systems, it's, it's getting shorter and shorter. So now we, I, I think we can assemble that within a week instead of, years so we really made some progress on the time scales and that's a picture on how it looks if the laser so the laser heads are already inside and it looks kind of messy so these are all uh, tools which are only uh, kept in the clean room so they are not wandering around and you know no, no dirty work with these tools but uh, it's not some super special things but we were wearing these bunny suits and you, you, you may, reala may realize that there's some of this clean room equipment looks like this stainless steel cabinets with this kind of tilted hood here, which, which is kind of made such that there's no dust settling on the, on the, on the cabinet. It's all kind of blown um, to the floor. And then the floor, there are some holes. And so the, all the dust just disappears somewhere in the underground. Okay, and uh, we also came up with a, um, a user manual, so it's it's kind of like a it's it's almost commercialized. So we we can just um, give somebody this user manual, give somebody this laser here, and then the somebody can just go ahead and and turn it on in principle if he's allowed to. There's another uh, manual, and that's a construction manual. That's something we don't give to to anybody. Um, but it basically describes how to put all the subcomponents together, how to align that system, how to put everything in place. And that's the, the purpose of this document is actually that we don't have to be around anymore if, if somebody wants to build a spare laser or a comp complete new laser. Um, the, the technical drawings are not in this thing, but we have some kind of, uh, I don't know if you know this Lego constructions for this Lego toys where people just, these drawings were just parts uh, and that thing is growing. So we try to make it kind of like that. That also circumvents the language problem that uh, you might, may have realized that I still have that sometimes. So pictures always help. <laughs> okay, so that was the, the, the work on the PSLs. And uh, as I said earlier, there was also some preparation at, at Livingston and Hanford required to, to do that. And the main things which had to be uh, changed on the infrastructure at these two sites were um, the cooling water for the laser and the cleanliness of, of that system. Uh, I, I mean, the systems before were also kind of covered and in the cabinet, but I will show you that at, at the sites there was quite a lot of effort to have it really, have it really clean. So it, it, it's really like the clean room at, at LZH. So let's talk a bit about um, uh, water, and we had an, we had endless discussions on on how do we ensure that that the water quality is good, what does good mean, and so on, and it basically boils down to these two um, <coughs> terms here: distilled water and deionized water. 
distilled water is water that has actually all the, the um, impurities r removed by um, distillation. So there are actually no bigger particles in that, no bacteria and so on. So it's kind of the water that um, um, I'm still getting confused with these terms. Um, I, I think you can buy something that, that's called distilled water for drinking. But uh, I think I learned at school that you don't want to drink it. You would rather want to refill your car battery with that stuff or so. And then there is something called deionizer. That's uh, water which runs through a deionizer, some sort of cartridge. And that actually removes really all the ions, which are all the free ions as cations from sodium, calcium, iron, and so on uh, from, that, from that water. So, yeah, and, and, and this process doesn't rem remove uncharged particles as bacteria and so on. So the question is, what do we want for LIGO? And, and as I said, we had really endless discussions like, what do we want? Because you don't want to have um, too much of, um, 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 of this um, uh, deionization because that, that would really cause some damage in it. And, and, um, and, and the unit which you use to, to measure the, the grade of the deionization is the resistivity or the conductivity, depending on, on what you want. And um, well, the, temperature, the cooling temperature is pretty much clear for the laser, so we agreed that it has to be something between 20, uh, 15 and 20 degrees C. So usually the chillers are operating at something like 16 degrees or so. But um, on this scale, it's, it's a bit more tricky. Um, so, so you don't want to have this super aggressive water where actually all the ions are removed because that basically really eats up the materials in the laser. So you don't want to have that. But also you don't want to have it too poor because you don't want to have any, any salts or particles some, somehow settling down in that laser and then blocking the, the whole thing. And we have seen that that really occurs. So with the laboratory prototype, when, when we remove the, the crystals, we have all, all, always seen uh, kind of a white layer on the crystals and we were really wor worried on, on the barrel of the crystals and we were re really worried that that might um, heat up because we have this internal uh, reflections of the pump light inside the crystal so it might either heat up or this internal reflection doesn't work anymore or who knows what can happen or might come off and block the water hoses or so. So we really want to have something in between and, um, and somebody found this Actually, this graphic here somewhere on the on the internet, so I didn't make it by myself. We found it from some, I don't know if it was a laser company or something, but that actually really helped us, and we decided to put the PSL um, somewhere here. So what what's normally done is we buy some distilled water, put it into the chiller tank, and then we keep the, the resistivity of, of that water in that region, and that's done by a DI cartridge, which is put by a bypass in that, that chiller, so it runs in a normal operation. And then there is a sensor, and if it's measured that, the, um, that, that these data are, are getting too bad, so the, the, the resistivity goes, goes down, then the bypass opens and the water is filtered through this DI cartridge and, and, and keeps it in this range here. Okay. Um, where do you see that? DI, that's uh, deionized, deionization, yeah. Sorry for that, yeah. Oh, and, and all the materials in that. Uh, oh, I, I wanted to come back to this gold coating. So actually, uh, uh, the, the heat sinks are made from copper. But copper is a, is, a, is a material which is really bad if you have kind of an aggressive water. So it's really eaten away. It's getting this, this uh, greenish layer. And eventually, the water just becomes black if there's some oxygen involved and so on. So we wanted to have some layer of, um, uh, of material which doesn't have these properties. And gold is expensive, but that's a, the that's a way to go, actually. So that, that, that's why all these uh, water-cooled components have this nice, shiny yellow um, color. So, fortunately, it's all at the LIGO site and not somewhere at home in my cabinet. So, um, 
Yeah, and of course also also we, we take care that nobody just connects a normal heat sink into that water circuit. So we were really, uh, I, I would say almost a bit paranoid about people who, who might come in and say, oh, I have this power meter here, let's just plug it in into the PSL water circuit. So we really don't want that because aluminum and copper, that's kind of the worst combination one can do. So we, we only allow stainless steel. And I think even that's one point where even the chiller had been customized, so there's a special turbine in it. And um, all, the, all the heat sinks and, and connectors and so on are made either from plastic or stainless steel. Okay, uh, yeah, I already told you that we've seen this contamination of the crystal. So it is a white layer from, from the aluminum pump chambers, which we used in early versions of the system. So they're also machined from stainless steel right now. And um, yeah, all the, all the connectors are basically either plastic or stainless steel. Okay, so here's a, system, here's a schematic of the water system. Um, so there are actually, um, um, th there are several locations for the laser. So you have the laser somewhere in this sort of clean room, which I comment on. That's uh, the PSL enclosure or laser area enclosure with a little room for a preparation. And that is actually sitting in, in the LVA, the laser, um, the, the laser vacuum enclosed area. Uh, so that's, that's actually the, the, that room where all the vacuum tanks and, and all that stuff is standing. Um, but the chillers are, are outside that room in some sort of anteroom. So that's this 100 meter lines I was talking about earlier because people were worried about vibrations from, from the chillers. And you can see that there are more than just two lines running. There, there are like uh, one um, uh, input and one output to the sort of distrib distributor here for the laser itself. And then there is another chiller, this bottom thing here, which cools the laser diodes, which are also put in this, in this uh, separate room. And there is a little, um, yeah, a little bypass valve, which also gives some light to the PSL table for other components which are not really related to the to the uh, to the laser, but you know sometimes you need a power meter or or other things around that. And the reason why we why we have this extra line here, so it's also clean water, but the reason why we have that is that we really want to have full control over the water uh, flow and and pressure inside the laser box. So if somebody connects something, then that then, then there is a certain amount of water stolen, and we were really worried that that might somehow affect the water flow inside the, the, the laser box itself, the oscillator mainly. And then, you know, you would change the, the thermal conditions inside that laser and you would change the thermal lens and it would change the stability range and it would kind of mess the whole thing up. So that's why there's this extra line. And it's not that critical for the heat sinks of the laser uh, diet um, boxes. And um, that's how it looks like. So that's this commercial chillers and it's, it, it's basically just pushed into a rack. So these are the normal chillers that you can just, just buy from a company and then this rack is kind of customized and the whole thing has an interface on the back which you can use for some computer control of um, these things. And there are, there are actually four of these chillers because there's again one spare set and one which is um, just in use. In, in Hanford, it's a bit different. As I said, they have two. Originally, they had two um, uh, Michelsons, and for one of the Michelsons, the situation is the situation is like here. But they had only one diet room, and the other one was si sort of placed in the uh, LVEA. So they had to do something against this damping. And actually, there's still one chiller, I think, just hanging on on a kind of it looks as a kind of crane, which is connected not really to the concrete of the LVEA, but to some somewhere, some place deeper in the ground. And then the chiller is basically hanging there on some sort of suspension. So and that the, the idea behind that was that you really want to get rid of the, um, of, the, of the shaking that is caused by the turbines of these chillers. It's a passive control loop. OK. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I can quickly go through that. So we agreed. So these are the hoses which come with the laser. And then the chiller room, there are these valves. And then you have this 100 meter lines of, of this bluish plastic tubing, which is kind of, kind of easy to, to put in. So it, 
it's just some plastic material and then you can basically glue that together and then hope that there are no leakages. So that were the very first days of the installation we have done that it was kind of dripping everywhere and it had to be resealed. So it goes from the chiller room to the uh, LVA and then there is a feed through to, to this wall and that's basically a box which is sitting somewhere in this in this huge um, uh, hall and inside there is the laser. So the tubes come out of this hole here and then on the other end there is an open end with a valve here <coughs> and then again there is this, this reddish reinforced hose with, which goes to these water distributors which are built for the lasers. And um, this distributor for the laser box here has actually four outputs and a bypass in case that you don't want to have too much water. And um, it, it has actually a, um, an, a outputs for the four laser heads. So um, you may see these um, hoses here in the, in the back of this connector. And then they, they're connecting all the heat sinks inside the the oscillator, so that's a kind of a side picture of the oscillator, and that's the water that goes through all these little heat things here. You have a, a separate uh, circuit for the uh, for the power meters inside inside the the laser box. You have another circuit for the front end, this thing here, and all of these um, circuits are controlled by flow meters and also by pressure sensors. Uh, except this one. So that's a water circuit for the four laser crystals. It's the biggest hoses and we try to keep a, as much water as we can running to the laser crystals because we wanted to have the cooling as good as we can in the, at, at that position. Okay, now cleanliness. Um, I already told you that that we came up with a, with a, um, a, a clean room at LZH and um, this is a little gallery I, I made from the early days with a with a laboratory prototype. It's it's beautiful pictures again, but um, again we we were not asked to do artwork, so we want to have some really clean and nice system. And whenever you see something like that, that this coating has kind of this fancy colors here, like this these rings or so, you can be almost sure that there was a dust particle somewhere that dust particle was absorbing either laser light or pump light and then the, the coating is basically uh, melted. So th this, this one here is sort of obvious. I mean you see this seven patterns. So that's the end phase of one of the homogenizers, the, the pump side actually, the side where the, um, uh, where the fibers come in and apparently there was some huge dust particle on that surface and that basically blow this this surface away. So that's, an, that's normally AR coated. In this case, it's so bad that you don't even see the leftovers of the coating. So I guess that there was also some material from the fibers settling down on that and then you ran into these problems. And yeah, the, the, I mean, these are the, the first rules of thumb that you can, or the things you can do to not have these effects. Try to come with some proper gowning, like there's special clean room stuff available, build at least an enclosure, uh, an enclosure. And that's actually one of the reasons why we don't have this system just sitting on a, on a breadboard anymore. We really wanted to have a covered system with a lid on it and you can close it and you can possibly even, even seal it and then you can be sure that there's nothing going inside. And of course you want to work with flow benches whenever you open something and try to have clean air. Yeah, I think I can skip this. Yeah.
when you do this calculation with these tiny particles, you always find that it's several thousand degrees, and that's why it's yeah. always easily able to You basically tip by your coding. Were these uh, enclosures also uh, some kind of acoustic shielding, or was it only just no, dust shielding? No, no. I mean, we were not doing the stabilization at LZH, so we were only worried about dust. And, uh, and it's, it's nice to have this class 1000 clean room. It was always clean air. Nobody wants to come in and steal your tools because you have to wear this proper downing. <laughs> you have to go through some sort of, of, of sluice and so on. And the, Temperature is stable, it's really clean, clean filtered air. So the way it works is like there's the HEPA filters at the ceiling here, then the, the and there are holes at, at the bottom, these are separate plates, and then the air is sort of uh, and there is it's a quartz floor actually, so the air is flowing here, and on the other side of these walls it's put back. So it's a box in a box, and the air is constantly just flowing around and, and climatized and kept at a at a really comfortable humidity and so on. So um, I really liked to work in a clean room actually. No disturbances, was quiet. You know, the phone doesn't work very properly, so there's a, special, uh, there's a special clean room phone, but it's really messy to use it, so nobody wants to call you. It's, it's really nice to work there. Um, Shake the beam? Um, I would guess so. Uh, we haven't done any measurements. And um, well, these systems, not, not in this picture, but these systems are sort of uh, boxed. But there's some free space, for example, between uh, this thing and, and the, uh, the, the MOPA and the, the oscillator. And um, there are also mirror mounts in between that. So I would guess that the airflow would, would cause vibration. So yeah, yeah. So we, when we did the first um, relative power uh, noise measurements with this diagnostic breadboard here, we, we kind of tuned it at least a bit down. Yeah. But I cannot really say how much airflow causes how much trouble. But yeah, at the sides, that's, that's done. And I'm going to comment on, on that on the next slide, actually. So uh, LIGO decided to do the, the same thing. Uh, and as I, as I said earlier, they built this, um, this laser, laser enclosure here with an anteroom. It's, it's not as, as big as a clean room at LZH. But it doesn't have to cover that many components. I mean, you don't want to build a laser in that. It's just standing there, and actually nobody ha really has to, has to touch it. And the, the second, f this false wall, wall that's actually, um, well, the LVA itself takes the role of that. So it's, it's already a kind of a clean environment, and you can take that as a, this huge area as a, as a false wall. OK. Um, yeah, and in this case, you have some acoustic um, uh, shielding because you really want to have a, have a quiet environment. You want to get rid of as much acoustic noise as possible. And um, there are two modes, like this installation mode and the science mode. And science mode means that you really turn down the flow boxes to a minimum to just keep a minimal overpressure in that room because you don't want to have any particles flying from the LVEA into that room, but you really bring it down to a minimum. You don't need that much air conditioning anymore, and that ensures that you really have a quiet environment for the interferometer. All right. Um, I think so. It, it probably does. I mean, we don't have seen that much temperature changes inside the laser box, but uh, I think a bit of an air conditioning is still required. But if there's nobody around, I mean, the, the main heat source is human beings and electronics. And if you turn off uh, all the computer monitors, and if there's nobody working in that room, then uh, I think you don't need that much. And I'm not sure if they're really doing an active air conditioning or if they use the air conditioning of the LVA to keep that at, 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 a, at a constant level. I think they use the air conditioning of the LVA even. I mean, and, and as I said, at least what the, what the oscillator, um, if, I, if I speak for the oscillator, then, then we really try to block as much light as possible for that reason. So we don't want to have things heating up. We want to rather bring it to the cooling water than to the air in that room. Not that many more components. I mean, there might be some scattered light, but 
or people try to keep it at, at a minimum. And again, I have some pictures on how it's built. And for me, it was a bit surprising that the first thing they do if they build this enclosure is they, they put the legs for the optical table in place. So that's kind of the very first thing they do. And the reason is, yes? Can we build it and the reference system was built that was on a floating table? Yes. Uh, here it's a rigid table. So do you see a difference in the noise between these two systems? Um, um, yes, I think I've, I've shown this curve before. And, um, but I'm not really sure if that's related to the fact that, it, that, it, that the reference system is sitting on a floating table. My feeling is rather that at, at the AI, where that system is operating right now, they don't have this sort of clean room. It's a normal lab with these uh, curtains around it. The box, it's a box system, so it's sealed, but it's, it's not really quiet. So I think people are working there all the time, so I think that's so the process is additional um, noise on the reference. Um, yeah, as I said, it's um, uh, I, I actually again I'm, I'm I'm cheating a bit because these are, are pictures which were taken at Hanford, <coughs> and that's at at Livingston. So those I've stolen from the electronic logbook actually, and um, these pictures I took myself. And I remember that because I remember these holes in the ceiling and in the walls when we came to install the laser, and the first thing we had to do was actually cutting these plates and then fitting them them into the ceiling. So it was kind of funny and also kind of fun to <laughs> do this more, you know, more not scientific work, but great, great to see some progress. And so if the evening, in, in the evening, the clean room looks like this, and then it's really a great feeling. And it really gives you the feeling that you've done something that day. OK, and that's how it looks like. So in, in this case, the optical table is still covered. So eventually, people would remove this cover and then put the laser box on the table. So that's kind of the first thing that went in, because it's the, the thing which you don't want to lift over other components on the optical table. So this oscillator is, has a weight of something like 300 kilograms or so. And uh, we were really worried on how, how can we handle that. Is it, is it good for four people? I mean, there are no handles on that thing, and it's wrapped in some plastic foil. So how do you put that on the table? And because we were really worried about that, that was kind of the first thing, thing that we that we did. Actually, I, I think I have another video showing on how that how we put that thing on the on the table. But it was basically done by a by a little crane, which we had to assemble inside this enclosure, and then we were lifting it up and putting it on the table. And that's um, an interesting picture because this is the the down uh, side of the oscillator itself. As you can see, it has this little round uh, plates sitting here. And the reason for these plates is that um, we want to have a really plain surface for the breadboard, which where the laser is sitting on. But on the other hand, it's a huge machine part. It's like two meters long and a meter wide or so. And it's impossible to, to manufacture that with a, with a decent precision. But what you can do with a decent precision is these little, these little plates here. So And that's why there are these little. Um, yeah, these this grooves in the, on, on, the, on the downside of that laser. And then there are little disks sitting. And that's where the laser rests on. However, um, I'm showing these pictures because, I mean, this is a 300 watt laser. And this guy is just standing here with his bare shoes. And we didn't really know what we are doing. So if this thing falls down, it, he's probably never going to run again. And also, it's a clean room. So you don't want to have this situation. You want to have a proper gowning. So um, uh, if, if you ever want to install one of these lasers, please don't do that. Wear sh shoes with steel caps. And yeah, I think that's a more important part. And it's more important than the fact that yes, this is bare legs here. <laughs> it's kind of warm in, in, in Louisiana. So <laughs> and the Germans l don't like that. So that's why he probably just had this frog. <laughs> OK, now I'm going to show you a couple of slides on, on how we ship that that laser to the US. Step one is, of course, packing all the components. So as I said, we did all the pre-alignment and everything um, at LZH. And there were a lot of components and electronics and so on to pack. And you might realize that there are now these hooks sticking out of the lid of the laser. And uh, th that's also another point we were really thinking about a lot. How do you lift that thing, right? You can't just grab the, this, this relatively thin thing here and then just 
just lift it with a crane or so, and you don't want to have this base plate to be deformed. So there's actually a frame inside, and I think I have a picture later showing how it's made. And that frame is attached to the, to the base plate. It's really calculated how the stresses are and how long, uh, I mean, how, how far above the hook has to be for this thing. And uh, if, you, if you want to move that laser, you have to basically open the box, remove the side walls, um, get rid of some parts inside, put this transport frame in, and then reseal this thing for, for uh, being able to put a crane on it. And then we hired, um, actually it's, it's not that great to see, but we hired somebody who, who's a specialist in packing these things, and we had this vacuum sealing and so on because I mean, it, it, it's kind of, for us, it was kind of the first time that we were really doing some clean stuff. So we didn't have any equipment, and we didn't have any idea how to do that properly. So we just hired somebody who, who knows how to do that. And then, of course, we, we hired somebody to, to put all the stuff into these boxes and also into a container. And of course, everybody was happy when they really left Hanover because we had the feeling, OK, that's a great a great first step for us. I mean, not, not for LIGO because they didn't went through, through all this, but we were kind of happy when we had the feeling that we have done the first step, the thing is built, we know that, that it's worked, we did some characterization and so on. So um, yeah, everybody has a smile. And, and I think it was also close to Christmas, so it was a great thing. So then we decided to ship that um, uh, thing to the US by ship and not by plane. That was also kind of a dis discussion. Um, but it turned out that the plane is much more expensive. So it wasn't that surprising for me. But I mean, some, some people thought it's, um, it's, surpri it's a surprise. And it's, I mean, I mean, the advantages would be that uh, the shipment would probably won't, won't take that long. but. You know, we we would have to come up with a different packing concept because that container won't fit into a, an airplane and, and and stuff like that. So, um, ship was a way to go, and it took about a month to bring it over from Germany. Actually, from actually the first part was done with the truck, and then it was shipped from uh, from Belgium, I think, and then over the Atlantic Ocean to Louisiana. Well, and then we didn't have to bother with the, with the unpacking and so on. We just let the American guys do all the work and let them store that in some, at some, some space at the sites. Uh, for the unpacking of, of the boxes, of course, we, we came over. And um, we were thinking about how to do that because the LVA is also kind of a clean environment. But um, the, the first laser was kind of easy because at that point it wasn't that clean at all. So we were allowed to bring at least these wooden boxes in. So I, I guess you can't do that now anymore because wood is kind of a no-go material. Um, so for the Hanford laser, it was a bit more difficult because we had to unpack everything at some different place and then carry this all the components over to the laser room. And then we kind of had to decide when do we want want to get rid of this of all this wrapping material here do we want to do that inside the the PSL enclosure or do we want to do it at the LVA so both has kind of advantages and disadvantages and I think we unpacked it in the LVA and then just brought it in and then of course um, all the components have to uh, sort of arrange at the sides I already said that we have this chiller room somewhere with the fibers running here there was a lot of electronic uh, involved for the diet boxes and, and the computer control and all the stuff that's sitting here. And um, then in Hanford, there are these two laser area enclosures. Um, as I said, I, I think the, the, the chiller room and the laser diet room for this H2 enclosure is, is placed somewhere here inside the LVA. Yeah, that's a picture on how we put that laser on a on the table, this is how the how this uh, sometimes we call it power of tower looks like. It's called like that because there are these high power laser diet boxes in it, and also the power supplies for that. And then there's a, a control computer and a control box, and that's placed outside the LVA in this room. Yeah, not everything went so well. The chiller hadn't been shipped from from us, but by the company who builds these chillers, and one of them was actually kind of a bit 
a bit a bit damaged. So it, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad as it looks at these pictures, but um, could be easily repaired. But yeah, I mean, apart from that, everything went pretty smoothly, I think. Okay, so the three lasers we had were um, uh, the, the LLO1 laser, so that's the Livingston laser, which we gave it the serial number one, OPS1. And that was delivered and installed in March 2011. And that's the, the clean room at Livingston. So yeah, the laser is in place and everything works kind of nice. Hanford laser at the two kilometer setup, that was the next laser we installed in October 2011. So it's not too far away from this one. So it, it would be kind of impossible to do the installation here in March and then start building the next laser. So we were pretty happy that we've built all the lasers at once. And that's a picture of that enclosure. And also the third laser was, um, was already delivered. And it w the, the plan was to install that for the long uh, Michelson and Hanford as well. So it was delivered in 2012. And the enclosure was already built. So that, that's where these pictures came from I showed earlier. And then things, uh, things changed. So people came up with this idea, oh, we want to have another interferometer somewhere, somewhere further south. And I've um, this slide, so, so these, these pictures I've, I've taken from, from this paper here. So that guy is apparently pretty good in creating these graphs here. And what these graphs show is, is, um, the, is how precise can you locate, uh, I think in this case it's a binary, binary uh, uh, neutron star event in something like 160 megaparsec distance. How, how exact can you? Uh, say where this event takes place. And this, this, is, this here is the situation for the two Hanford lasers, Hanford, Hanford, uh, Livingston, Virgo. So it's four interferometers involved in this detection. And the uncertainty um, is shown by this, um, by the, by this blue um, yeah, kind of elliptical shaped things here. The red crosses are the blind spots where, where this network of um, detectors actually can't see anything at all. So it's a calculated picture. And then um, th there was a reason for people want, wanting to, to have, wanted to have a, another laser somewhere else in the world. So this is the same situation, uh, except that one of the Hanford lasers is replaced by another detector somewhere in Australia. As you can see, these error ellipses here are, are much, much smaller. So it's a much better um, uh, situation. You can really locate where an event takes place. And there are still a couple of blind spots, but the errors are much smaller. Um, however, it, it didn't work out that well. And um, that's where LIGO India actually um, comes into the game. And again, so, so now one of the Hanford lasers is replaced by a, by a by a, by a detector in India. As you can see, again, the, the error ellipses are much smaller than in this situation. And you even get rid of this blind spot. So it's really a scientific uh, improvement to have one of the observatories somewhere else in the world. Um, OK. So um, yeah, of course, we were all pretty excited about that. So everybody was, was happy that we can, can do it better than it was originally planned. But for us, it also caused some trouble because um, then people wanted to have the, the system which had already been installed at the two kilometer setup in Hanford. They wanted to have it for the four kilometer um, setup, of course. And it's, it's not like you just put a steering mirror in and then you steer the beam into the four kilometer setup. Um, instead, you have to remove the whole thing. So you have to move everything from one enclosure, so this is the Livingston um, situation actually, but you want to move all the stuff which had been installed from one enclosure to the other one. And you also want to uh, move all the electronics and diet boxes and so to the, the place where it's supposed to be then. So, and, and of course, the uh, laser which had been delivered to Hanford but not installed yet need to, need, needed to be somewhere stored in Hanford until it's clear where that uh, LIGO India laser is going to be installed. And of course, it needs to be shipped, which is luckily not, not my problem. But we'll see how well it goes. So in other words, uh, we want to move it. So th th this is an outline of the LVEA with the two enclosures. 
and the whole thing needs to be moved from here to there or from from here to there so it's a th kind of a I think it's not 360 degrees but I tried to stitch a couple of pictures together to show from where to where that all the equipment is going to be moved. And I have um, a series of pictures showing how much time it took so that's kind of so, so that they called us again and and asked to to help out with the with the move of the whole laser so that's kind of the situation at the first day this is the enclosure the new enclosure the h1 enclosure table is still covered it's but the, the clean room is is built in this case except of the monitors and some other infrastructure and um, yeah this is the situation in the in the uh, um, old enclosure the first thing is we removed all the water connectors got the pump fibers out here so every try to seal everything and, and basically be ready for the transport to this thing. Fourth day, it, it looks like that. So this room here is kind of ready. You see the, the, the amplifier already disappeared. So the table is by far less, less, less packed. And um, that's the transport frame I was talking about earlier. So that's already in place. And that thing is basically ready to be moved over. So we did that on the fifth day. So that's a flying oscillator box here. And um, then we had this crane and put it on the new table. In the meanwhile, also the, these monitors here appeared in that new uh, enclosure. That's also the fifth day. So we started to put all the components in place on this new optical table. And the old table is getting kind of empty. Uh, day six, uh, making good progress. Actually, and then on the within a week, basically a bit more than a than a work week, we were able to start with the realignment of that system because, of course, it, it's never going to be the same as it was before. So we had to tune some things, and um, that was basically it. Apart from some other equipment which also had to be moved, like the pump pump diodes and this this tower here, all the electronics, and um, the part I was. Personally, most worried about are the pump fibers because they're kind of critical. It's 100 meter long fibers, and you have to route them ar along in the in the AVA and then bring them to the laser and so on. So that can cause a lot of trouble. And there are also spare fibers which are also already in place. Oh, actually, I didn't really want to show this picture. So that's the result we got after after four weeks of moving things around. Okay. Okay. So now, let, if I have some. Do I have some more time? Or? OK, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I think I'm going to skip some of these slides because it's, um, yeah, uh, we will see. So let's talk about a, a bit about uh, user interface. And there are actually a couple of different interfaces. So one is, for example, the cooling water, which runs uh, from the, um, oh, I think that's an, that's an old picture here. No, it's not an old picture. It's a new picture. So this is the laser diet room. This is the AVA, and this is the the um, PSL enclosure. And the water is, as I said, running from the, these chillers to the laser and also to the laser diets. But of course, there are also a lot of other interfaces involved, as pump light, which runs from the laser diet room to the laser, electronic connections. So this is a back of terminal. So we need some sort of control right next to the lasers. If people are working there, they, they of course, want to have some user interface that they can, they can use to turn that laser off and on, so to basically control um, this electronics here, and also to control this computer. So this, this is actually the terminal, which is where, where the, the user interface for the computer is living. So it's not the, the user, user interface LIGO is using. That's another interface, which is shown here. So normally, uh, LIGO uses the CDS interface, but there's also an independent software for that laser that we actually used when we built that system and which is still around. And we wanted to have it when we were working on that system in, in this area here. Yeah, I think I'm going to skip these. So these are the two user interfaces. That's a, the, the back of interface. And that's the uh, GUI. For these epic screens, I, I already commented a bit on, and, and that's actually the, the interface that the normal user, the, the non-installation team, wants to wants to use. Yes. Uh, uh, 
I don't really remember actually why. <laughs> Do you see something funny or? <laughs> I thought it's unnatural for you to fill it out in English, so you must have I think that I think that it was always in English because it was kind of clear who's going to be the end user. So uh, I, I think it was all in English from the beginning on. That's a good question. I actually do not really remember for sure. <laughs> OK, so th th this is some more infrastructure. So that's the uh, CDS room, where actually all the models and so on live. These are the PSL racks. So they are, they are really next to the PSL enclosure. So the, this is actually the wall of that room where the, where the laser stays. And there are some components which you can't put like 100 meters away. For example, the, the uh, uh, control electronics for the NPRO that has to be here somewhere next to the laser because uh, the cables can't be too long. Then it doesn't work anymore. And there are also some, some other things like filters and delay lines and so on. And they are all put right next. They're in the LVA in these racks. And then we have all these purple cables here going to some other place where the data then are stored and control takes place. Okay, this is one of these backoff terminals. So that's actually the, 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 the system which had been used to, uh, to build the user interface and the laser. And um, actually, it's, it's, a really, it's a really cool system if you want to build some industrial capable uh, device or so. It consists of several um, um, uh, terminals. That's how it's called. And you can just stick them together. So from time to time, you need a terminal which provides uh, the, the, the voltage for, for this whole device. But you can put them next to each other. And then you would have a, um, uh, a user interface which you can use to do a graphical programming of that thing. So it's kind of easy to design the user interface, really. So you don't have to type everything in. And it's a, it's a really nice industrial um, um, uh, software. Um, and these clamps are actually in all of the, the diode boxes. So, so you have to connect them somewhere. In the beginning, uh, we used the light bus system. So it's actually, uh, it's basically optical fibers. And then you connect the diode boxes. And you, then you tell the software what, what's at each node of this um, uh, system. And it can even detect if something fails at a certain Position and that that was actually quite quite often the case. So for the for the functional prototype, for example, we were still using this light bus system, but it turned out that the fibers are not that great. So from time to time, it just failed, and then um, you disconnect the fiber. It tells you where the error occurs. You look at the fiber, you see there's a red dot. So that that, that system is in principle alive, but um, yeah, for some reason it doesn't work. And then you try to clean the fiber, reconnect it, doesn't work. You clean it again, and then eventually it works. So it was kind of a bit messy. So we were quite happy when we figured out that, you, that we don't have to use this light bus system, but that there, you can also use an Ethernet connection. And that's it. So that's, that's much easier than, than working with the fibers all the time. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the uh, user interface in English. And, the, and as you can see, there are, that's the main interface, which is programmed in back off. And there are a couple of knobs and parameters. So for example, there's, an, there's a monitor for the output power. You can have a, a quick look at the trend and then see what was going on. And then you have a couple of other knobs. Um, I think I have a couple of slides which show on what happens if you press, press for example, this knob here, number five. Then you end up in, in a different menu where you can set the diet current and the diet temperatures, do some diagnostics. So that, that's a control screen for the, for, the, uh, for the injection locking, which can be turned on and off. Just quickly go through that. That's chiller interface. So they are also controlled by remote control. And I think I've al already shown you this status screen here. OK, but the thing that the normal user uses are this, um, uh, is this Epix control. And there are these MEDM screens, which are apparently also sort of easy to program. I've, I've never done that by myself. But um, um, that's actually what people use. And you can actually have access from different computers at the same time. And there are basically, for the PSL, there are basically like six different screens. 
this is the PSL status screen and then well it actually well, the nice thing is that is that it has all this green light so I think at AI there is a big monitor hanging with like uh, three or three of these status screens here open at the same time for the three different laser systems which are actually running and if one of these little LED imitations here becomes red then they just grab the phone, ring hand, hang for it and ask what's, what, what's going on, why the system is not running properly. So kind of nice to have. And there is this uh, screen which uh, looks pretty similar to the back of screen. And I think this was probably inspired by the back of screen as also the same functionality except that some of the data can be directly read from this screen but you can also uh, press at certain regions and then you come to a sub menu and then you can change the settings. But there are also um, screens for for example for the diagnostic breadboard several operation modes so you can use that to do some uh, automated measurements with the breadboard like grin measurements you have a auto, an automated lock acquisition you can also do things manually and you can also turn off the electronics at all such that you can use a good old analog potentiometer and so on which I kind of liked in the beginning in the meanwhile I sort of like the fact that you can just uh, align everything press a knob and then you end up with a PDF which basically tells you what's going on so I think it's a it's, it's a really nice thing to have and there is a control screen for the Primo cleaner as some automated um, uh, lock acquisition and um, yeah, actually you can, you have access to all the parameters, you can change the, the loop gain and, and things like that and you basically have a good control over what, what's going on. Same for the power stabilization, so these are the two uh, independent photo diodes here with a switch, so for the in-loop measurement and for the out-of-loop measurement, that's the part I was talking about earlier this morning and you can choose which photo diode you want and you have all these nice schematics here which actually show what's going on. <clears throat> and then here is the screen which shows the refracted power for the AOM, that's the actuator for that thing, so you can immediately see uh, how well the, the locking goes. That's another screen for the frequency stabilization with all the controls and um, yeah, I think I don't have to go too much into the detail with that. So as a summary, I've, I've shown you a bit about the history of that laser. I gave you an idea on how we sent that laser to the US and how we installed it there. And I think that's going to happen soon in India somewhere. And um, yeah, I tried to give you at least an idea on how the user interfaces look like. So I, I mean, if somebody has a really detailed question on which knob you have to press to get a certain effect, I can comment on that. But I think I don't want to go through the manual right now. Okay. So um, do you have questions?